So today we have with us Professor Suresh Gadde from uh, Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Ottawa, Canada. So uh, just a brief introduction to Professor Suresh. So Professor Suresh is an assistant professor in the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the University of Ottawa. He did his PhD at Wichita State University and postdoctoral work at the University of Miami and Brigham and Women's Hospital Harvard Uni Medical School. The overarching goal of his current research program is to develop nano-sized tools to study and understand the biology of different diseases and the factors causing their progress and develop therapeutic strategies. In addition, his group also explores a nanobio interactions uh, in these diseases set in these disease settings to create a feedback loop to identify novel targets and improve the nanotechnologies. So, uh, okay, so uh, this uh, seminar is being organized by Author Cafe, and uh, and uh, everyone is requested to uh, mute yourselves. And uh, at the end of the talk, we can actually take a few questions. Uh, so, over to you, Professor Suresh. So, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so this is the title of my talk. So, just enter. Or? Just click on this. Yeah, now you can use it. Okay, okay. Sorry. Thank you. So, University of Ottawa is located on uh, indigenous land. So, we pay respects to all the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We also acknowledge their long standing relationship with the territory, which remains unceded. <clears throat> so, this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to give a brief introduction about the nanomedicines. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we are developing uh, nanomedicines in our lab. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about uh, um, what we did in last four years in terms of uh, nanoparticles or nanomedicines development. And then I'm going to take like a last 10, 15 minutes to talk about the, my research program and the future directions and also the questions we want to answer uh, to see if anybody was interested in uh, interested in collaborating with us or like or whatever, uh, whatever their interests are. So, if you attend uh, any recent cancer conferences or any disease conferences, the uh, most most of the time, the the most important talk is not given by the clinician or the basic scientist. It's always about uh, uh, patient survival or the patient. So, most of the times, the outcome of this talk is always about. Um, there's an urgent need to improve the therapies. This is true for cancer therapies and also any other disease therapies. So uh, the, it is important to um, important to cure the disease or the treat the patient, but at the same time, it's also equally important to have the quality, improve the quality of the life of the patient during the treatment and also after the treatment. So this is where uh, my research program, Nanomedicine, comes into uh, picture. So the nanomedicines have a uh, capacity and also capabilities to uh, to improve the therapeutic uh, therapeutic outcome of uh, different uh, different uh, um, different drug therapy uh, sorry different regimens. At also at the same time, it's also have capacity and capability to uh, decrease the toxic side effects and improve the quality of the life of the patients. So what what are these nanomedicines? So basically, nanomedicines are uh, nanomedicine is um, well, nanotechnology application or nanobiotechnology applications in medicine. This is very broad and uh, multidisciplinary research area that involves nanoscience, physics, materials chemistry, molecular biology, pharmaceutics, and also medicine. And also, one of the important point uh, important component for the nanomedicine is the uh, clinical translation. So this this field is kind of kick started in like early 2005 or 2006. I don't want to go all the details, but one of the component for the uh, one of the main uh, component for the nanomedicines is these nanomaterials or these nanomedicines has to have a size around 100 nanometers or less or a little bit more. Also, it's okay. So to put this in the perspective. Okay. 
so we are literally dealing around uh, at this range so this is the range a uh, lot of biological things are biological uh, reactions or biological components happening in the cell or in the disease conditions so we are literally dealing in that range that is the reason i feel i believe that is one of the reason we are having a very good therapeutic effects for the nanomedicines but the, at the same time on the negative side because we are dealing with a, such a small scale range uh, a, any any kind of variations or perturbations in the, in those nanometers properties even in the nano scale that will that will impact your therapeutic outcome so we really need to screen these nanoparticles or like a, optimize these nano uh, nanomaterials physical chemical properties very carefully to achieve a, um, achieve our targeted goals our target goals so again to give a, um, a little bit more info about the nanomedicines even though field kind of kick started in early 25 2005 or uh, 2006 or early 2000s so the nanomedicine applications are in in clinic are there for a while so almost like a 70 to 80 years so initially they are using liposome uh, to encapsulate hydrophobic drugs and then uh, uh, treat the patients uh, because at that point they are thinking that uh, you are increasing the solubility of the drugs so from that point onwards uh, in like a last 50 60 years these nanomedicines uh, not only evolved but also revolutionized the whole landscape of the drug development so in 2005 uh daxil became a first uh, sorry 1995 daxil became a first fda approved nanomedicine to give me one second okay nanomedicine to um enter into the clinic uh, into the clinic from that point on us there are several nanomedicines that are entered into the clinic or in the clinical trials for wide variety of disease applications and early 2010s and 2015s there are like a several targeted nanomedicines entered into the clinic uh, but they kind of bombed in uh, in the uh, either second phase or third phase of the clinical trials uh, because of variety of reasons and then uh, um, and then partiran this is a uh, sirna nanoparticle platform for polyneuropathy uh, into the uh, entered into the market and we have a very good uh, um, uh, effects for vixo and then uh, recently the covid-19 vaccines uh, those are also part of like lipodomes or like a solid lipid nanoparticle platforms uh, they are in uh, they are in the market uh, it shows that the potential of the nanomedicines so what are the advantage of these nanomedicines so they have a better pharmacokinetics better biodistribution uh, they, we do have like a longer circulation half lives and then if you are talking about cancer nanomedicines uh you have a higher tumor dose accumulation and most importantly they have a less side effects so how do we how do we uh, develop this yeah sure sure so yeah Yeah. The side effects. Especially the soprano part. so that's it okay so the people are concerned to take not the modern or pfizer nanoparticle formulation um, vaccines people are con- concerned to take like the the third one that do have a problem but that is, that that is a not that's not a nanoparticle formulation okay so the th- the third one i don't remember which one is that but the third one has a is a is a attenuated uh, Uh, right i don't know what is so that do have a problem so that was the concern but in like in us or in canada um, i don't think they had any problem selling or like convincing people to take covid-19 like a moderna or pfizer vaccines so 
and also the other thing is like you know so that's that's that is the other thing i'm trying to explain is that's also power of the nano medicines because if we don't have that formulation it might have taken long a, a lot more time for those vaccines to come into the market since those formulations are already optimized or approved are not approved but they are kind of optimized or they're kind of ready so that's why they developed this uh, covid-19 vaccines so quickly and they came into the market very quickly so 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 to develop any nano medicines these are the three components that we typically uh, consider uh, so what kind of nanoparticle platform we are using uh, what is the payload I, that means like what is the uh, drug that we want to encapsulate in the nano medicines or nanoparticle platforms and then like a, how do we want to deliver this nano medicine and uh, sorry where do we want to deliver this nano medicine and also how do we want to administer this nano medicine uh, into the body so these are the, these three are important components for us and uh, uh, we carefully design and optimize all these three components to have a uh, like a very good or uh, like a uh, successful nano nanotherapeutic platform so in our labs um, we have a capacity or capability to develop most of these so, uh, formulations uh, except uh, this four uh, which are not uh, um, um, which um, at this point i'm not super interested in but like a remaining remaining other components we can develop in our labs and we also have a capacity to uh, basically encapsulate a wide variety of uh, drug molecules that can be small molecules, macromolecules, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, uh, proteins, peptides. Um, so DNA, RNA, we also have a very good success with uh, uh, DNA, RNAs. Uh, currently, we are working on uh, developing a platforms to deliver CRISPR-Cas9, but we, we, haven't, we haven't had a success in, in that particular case. And then, um, depend on how do we... <laughs> Depend on um, how we want to deliver nanomedicines and also how do we want to administer nanomedicines. These nanomedicines has to overcome wide variety of physical, uh, uh, physiological barriers inside the body to reach the target, uh, target site. So some of the barriers are more important in, than other barriers depend on uh, how we are administering them and also what is the purpose of this, uh, this uh, um, these nanomedicines. So, um, and then like in, um, um, we can do like a wide variety of uh, deliveries. So to give one example for this one, uh, if you want to deliver siRNA or microRNAs to brain and you are doing a IV injections, so nanoparticles has to overcome, once you inject uh, IV injection, nanoparticles has to overcome the immune system uh, and then reach to the brain, cross the endothelial barrier and go into the uh, going to the brain so once they are entering into like a whatever the cell line we are targeting uh, they need to uh, enter into the cells get out of the endosomes and then like, nanoparticles has to release this uh, srna so these are the uh, uh, different different barriers your, your our platforms have to overcome to deliver uh, deliver the payload at the target site so nanoparticles cannot do all these things by by themselves so we have to optimize them or we have to uh, we have to um, we have to design them in such a way that these particles will overcome all these barriers and reach the target site and then deliver the payload so what are the typical steps in our uh, our nano projects um, so Typically, depend on the payload and or depend on what kind of a platform we are we want to use it uh, for that particular disease. Uh, we are typically going to do like a lot of organic chemistry. Uh, actually, I would not say a lot of organic chemistry because a lot of organic chemistry people are here. So we do some organic chemistry, not a lot. Um, we do like a, a biomaterial synthesis or uh, relevant biomaterial synthesis, and then we uh, after the characterization, we are going to develop nanoparticles. Okay. After the physical chemical characterization of these particles, uh, we are going to test them in in vitro to see if their particles are working or not, and then we are going to test them in in vivo. So even though I'm sure I'm starting here, it doesn't mean that we have to go all the time with the biomaterials. Once in a while, we will also do very quick and dirty experiments to see 
even if this uh, this uh, this thing is going to work or not so we can directly jump into in vitro because we have some nanoparticle platforms that we can we know that uh, we can use the, we, we can use for these things and then um, so even though we do like a uh, wide variety of uh, platforms uh, we typically uh, tend to use uh, uh, polymeric platforms initially because of the comfortability and also because it's well characterized so and also they are biodegradable so we tend to have some component of polymer into uh, our nanoparticle particles platforms so they are like a biodegradable biocompatible uh, they are very very easy to handle so we can also have a uh, if you have like a pure polymeric nanoparticles we can have a, a differential drug release a drug can be released via diffusion uh, erosion and then also degradation so we get we these polymeric platforms have a wide variety of advantages uh, like a we can do the targeted delivery. We can put like a lot of drug can, uh, targeting targeting ligands on the surface. Surface they are also very stable. That's one of the important thing. And also the one important thing I want to mention is the scalability. So most of the time when we do the lab setting, the minute we try to make them in like a, in the in a, in a higher batches, sometimes these physical chemical properties of nanomaterials are going to change. That will also influence the the therapeutic outcome. So some of these platforms are much easier to scalable than uh, other platforms. So then how do we uh, develop this, uh, this nanoparticle systems? So this is one example. There are several different ways to synthesize the nanoparticles. Um, but like a, the way I see is um, in most of the cases, it's always about, um, it's always about uh, playing with the hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions. So in this case, these are the PLGA peg nanoparticles or PLA peg nanoparticles. You have a hydrophobic component in this polymer and then hydrophilic component in the polymer. Typically, if you add them into water, uh, they are going to produce so, uh, some sort of formulations or uh, some, some sort of nanoparticle systems. So in this process, if you put hydrophobic drugs, those drugs are going to go and sit in the uh, inside the hydrophobic core of the polymer. Uh, we can also attach uh, targeting ligands by simply attaching uh, again like you know in particular cases not in all cases so we can simply attach the target targeting ligand at the end chain of the peg so in the formulation so you can decorate those targeting ligands on the surface of the nanoparticles so in this case we can also encapsulate hydrophilic drugs this is not just for the hydrophobic we just need to modify your polymers in such a way that you are going to have a hydrophilic cavity ins inside the nanoparticle system that can like a basically load your hydrophilic drugs or water soluble drugs. So this, this, this part looks very simple, but to synthesize nanoparticles, we have to basically use different formulations to have like a fine, a fine tuned nanoparticle system. Uh, I'm not going to, due, due to time, I'm not going to go through the formulation techniques. Uh, Let's just jump into uh, jump into what we did in like the last three four years and and so in last three four years I collaborated with the, uh, the like a multiple PIs to develop a nanomedicine research program at U Ottawa. So in this case we focused uh, basically on the cancer and cardiovascular disease applications. So I will quickly touch about the cardiovascular disease applications. So in this case, our our wish list or our our big picture idea is to develop a targeted nanotherapeutics or nanoparticle platforms to deliver drugs to atherosclerotic plug. Uh, this is a very uh, very serious condition for the cardiovascular con disease condition for the patients, where cholesterol accumulation in the artery walls uh, will will form inflammation, and it will become a chronic inflammation. Um, Chronic inflammation uh, basically causing a lot of pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory markers to accumulate, uh, leading to like a necrotic core and you know, other things. So our idea here is to basically um, deliver uh, cholesterol efflux promoting molecules that can be small molecules, SARNAs or microRNAs, and also uh, pro uh, sorry anti-inflammatory uh, markers to atherosclerotic plug in a targeted way so that we can kick this cholesterol out of these arteries okay and then like a slowly this uh, endothelium line, line is going to uh, go back 
so and then like a, uh, so it's it's very easy it's uh, it's very difficult then uh, saying we also recently came to know that okay so the so initially our our uh, initially our idea is to target the macrophages and the foam cells but lately research is showing that uh, so the macrophages uh, are more smooth muscle cells are so contributing to this foam cell formation so now the now we also want to have like a sub plug targeting uh, nanoparticle systems where nanoparticles can uh, accumulate into this plug area hopefully go into the smooth muscle cells and then like a promote the cholesterol reflex so that they don't form the foam cells <laughs> so but like this is again like a, this is the a big picture idea so to do this one we did like a we started with a proof of proof of concept studies so first uh, first study we are interested in to interest, interested in is um <clears throat> Okay, interested in is to see can we even modulate the macrophage cholesterol efflux. So with that aim, what we did is we developed developed the nanoparticle system containing microRNA mimics. So here our idea is to see uh, if we can deliver, we can successfully deliver functional microRNA mimics to the macrophages and then modulate the cholesterol efflux. Again, this is a proof of concept study. So in this case, um, I don't want to go into the all details, but like after the characterization, so in the in vivo studies, what we did is we basically encapsulated either efflex promoting microRNAs or efflex inhibiting microRNAs. The concept here is if we are, if we deliver if we successfully deliver efflex promoting microRNAs, so macrophages are going to click uh, sorry kick cholesterol out that will reach to liver and then it will be excreted. Uh, if you are inhibiting, you are having a less cholesterol coming out of the macrophages. So that means you are less cholesterol excreted from the, uh, from the, uh, from the feces or the urine. So here is the data for that one. So when compared to the control nanoparticles, over the time we see a increased um, cholesterol coming out of the feces. Whereas when we are in it, when we are using a efflex inhibiting microRNA mimics, we see less cholesterol coming out when compared to the controls. So now we do know, now, now that we know that we can control macrophage cholesterol efflux, so the next question uh, we want to answer is, if we do a targeted delivery to the atherosclerotic plug using this efflux promoting microRNAs, or anti mirs for the MIR-33, how that is going to influence the, uh, the atherosclerotic plug. So that's what we are working on right now. So in the other way, I, in, in the same concept, so other thing we are also looking at is, um, so, so the idea here is, um, we think that because uh, atherosclerotic, um, atherosclerotic plug is like a kind of inflammatory site, you will have like a lot of redox active species upregulated in there. So we want to develop a nanoparticle system that are that are redox responsive. But again, before we go there, uh, the first thing we want to we want to answer or we want to ask is, uh, what kind of uh, redox response like if with the if you have a basal level uh, redox active species, how that is going to influence your nanoparticle system? So we developed uh, three different nanoparticle system that has a different redox responsive drug release. And then we used the LXR agonist. Again, this is a cholesterol efflux promoting nanopart, uh, promoting uh, drug. We encapsulated them and we treated them with the macrophages. So one important one important thing here is, so we did not um, uh, we did not modulate the macrophages. We we are just treated the, uh, the normal macrophages. So from there, like a, data is not super. Um, it's, we still need to do more studies on this one. But one thing we deduced is um, the basal level redox active species have a very little effect on our nanoparticle system in terms of the drug release. So now the next question is, if you modulate the macrophages or if you, if you increase the uh, redox active species concentration in these macrophages, how that is going to influence the drug release and also the, the ABCA1 expression.
so that is the that is the question we are trying to answer at this point in this particular uh, settings so the uh, so that is mainly about the cardiovascular disease uh, research so in cancer applications um so before i go into the cancer applications a couple of things about nanomedicines is the nanomedicines field started because people are noticing that uh, there is like a large molecules can accumulate into the solid tumors so that is how like a, the liposomes and then the polymers all this uh, uh, the field is started so one of the reason people believe are the working theory uh, kind of like a working theory uh, for this this is enhanced permeation and retention effect so to simplify this effect so what is that means is uh, when solid tumors are developing very quickly uh, you were, uh, you, were, you have a um, defective blood vessels and also you have endothelial cells that have some problems or some gaps and uh, people believe that nanoparticles can like uh, get out of the uh, this uh, blood blood circulation due to due to these gaps in uh, endothelial cells and also because of defective uh, lipidic system so your particles are going to be just accumulated there and then like a uh, release the drug so this this is this 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 is currently still is a working theory so but uh, when the lot of targeted nanoparticle systems kind of bombed in the in the in the clinical trials then a lot of people are asking like a, what how exactly these nanoparticles are accumulating in the tumors so uh, to be honest we still don't have like a lot of answers for this one but we uh, we are involved in a couple of studies in the uh, university of toronto with the warren chan group so in that particular study they showed that uh, basically nanoparticles can uh, can get out of the blood circulation in the tumor area by a passive way that means because do from the gaps and also from the active way active way by like a basically transcytosing to the endothelial cell lines so now we are not so sure exactly uh, what causing these particles to bind to these endothelial cell lines and like a let them trans transcytosis into the tumors so i think warren group is still working on it we believe that there are some markers expressed on the endothelial cell line inside the in the in the solid tumors that are causing these nanoparticles to uh, transcytosis is into the tumors so um but like if we do kind of know that these nanoparticles do accumulate in the tumors so sorry before i go how much time is that looks like i'm going very slow 15 more minutes okay thank you <laughs> okay so i will hurry up a little bit okay um so so i always show this uh, show this slide because this is uh, this is kind of like a showing that nanoparticles do accumulate in the tumors so in this case we have like a, this nano nano uh, nanoparticles that are 20 nanometer in size these particles are 100 nanometer in size tagged with two different uh, fluorophores so when we co injected them into the tail wine uh, and uh, the tumors are in the in the dorsal chamber and when we did the intravital imaging we do see that uh, no matter what is the size of these particles they do accumulate in the tumors after like a, after one hour and then they get out of the blood circulation they go into the uh, into the uh, tumor cells are tumor micro environments um then like a, are they both going into the same cell line that's a different story which i don't want to get in right now they might uh, the different populations in the tumor micro environment like different uh, different nanoparticle systems because of their size but like they do accumulate in the, into the tumors so but those those uh, tumors are cell line based tumors so our our working theory is that uh, because these cell lines are uh, continuously cultured over the time they will lose their heterogeneity and they become like a single cell uh, single cells so in those cases when we develop a tumors these tumors are don't really represent the heterogeneity and the complexity of the human tumors so so for that what we are thinking is we are thinking of using the patient derived genograft models in these particular models we are basically taking a chunk of uh, tumor piece from the human and directly putting them in a not skip mice once they grow we can like basically passes them directly into the mice so in this case the, our working theory is that these tumors um, um, hold on to heterogene heterogeneity 
and the three dimensional architect architecture of the patient tumors and they are they represent very close to the patient tumors so even though that's advantages it's also time consuming work and also there are some disadvantages such as after certain passages we cannot use these tumors anymore because uh, most uh, most macrophages or most cell lines are kind of like a penetrating into the patient tumors so so these are the tumors we employed for our studies and the first question we asked is for particularly in this case so do nanoparticles accumulate into the pdx tumors so for this one what we did is we tagged our nanoparticles uh, with alexa fluorophore and we IV injected them, and then we did a IV imaging. This is a whole body imaging of the mice at different time points. I'm not showing completely, but we did until 48 hours, and after 48 hours, we did not see any fluorescence coming out of the tumors. So we do see that uh, the fluorescence, uh, so tumors are here, PDX tumors. Uh, we do see that uh, fluorescence coming out of the tumors, but the IV imaging is like a, basically you put mice down and you are basically looking from the top. Um, so even though we see, we do know that tumors are there, that fluorescence can be coming from like a variety of organs too. So we are not so sure for. It. So next thing we did is after three hours, um, we sacrificed the mice, take all the tumors and all the organs, and then we did a flow cytometry to see what uh, what percent of the cell populations are nanoparticle fluorescence positive. We do see that like a tumors have a 34% of tumor cells have a nanoparticle fluorescence. Liver has a 8%. In this particular study, we did uh, we do see a lot of nanoparticles in the spleen. We have no idea why yet, uh, but uh, that's a little bit rare. We we expect to see more in the kidneys and liver. But anyway, so we do know that like a nanoparticles are accumulating in the tumors and are the PDX tumors. These are the TNBC PDX tumors. So with that, um, we went and we went ahead and do like a multiple studies uh, due to time limit i will highlight only a couple of studies of, of this one so our idea is to basically do the tnbc management by killing killing the bulk tumor mass uh, cancer stem cells and also vasculature shutdown uh, i'm not going to give the introduction for the triple negative breast cancer because a lot of people already know about this um, <clears throat> so so if you look at the patient data we do know that if you have a CAC higher, sorry, lower CAC population, your overall survival rate is high. But if you have a higher CAC population, your overall survival rate is low. So the first thing we are asking is, can we eradicate cancer stem cells? And also, can we kill uh, both bulk tumor mass and cancer stem cells using our nanotherapies? So, sorry, you guys cannot see this, uh, <laughs> these structures. So this is the word for firing that will uh, that will work on cancer stem cells. And this is the plaquelet axle that will work on the bulk tumor mass. Um, this is the, um, the nanoparticles characterization of the dual drug delivery system. This is a very, very typical for us. And uh, we do uh, we do tons of this work uh, uh, very quickly. So I'm going to skip that part and I will quickly show the animal work. So so basically, we surgically implanted these PDX tumors into the mice. Um, after two weeks of the surgery, we basically separated them into groups and we did the treatments. So one is a free drug treatment. Uh, this is a vehicle control and we have like a um, dual drug treatment. So we do notice that we are able to control the tumor value in, in, the, in the 20 days of treatment when compared to free drugs. So we do see some uh, some effects for the vehicle nanoparticles. Uh, this is the first time we saw. Uh, this is the only animal study we saw with the vehicle nanoparticles. Uh, some effects on the vehicle nanoparticles. Again, we have no idea why that is. Um, but even though we dose less amount for the nanoparticles when compared to free drug, we are able to control the tumor volumes uh, very very good for this uh, for this animal study. Uh, this is uh, basically the final tumor. Uh, uh, two more weights and everything. I'm going to skip that one. Um, one thing I want to highlight here is, so when compared to free drugs, uh, our nanoparticle system able to uh, eradicate or like a subdue the cancer stem cell populations uh, at both CD44 and CD24 and also all DH plus uh, CD, uh, CACs are the cancer stem cell populations. So from this study, we kind of know that we can control the bulk tumor mass and also we can we can control the cancer stem cells. So the next question, 
we want to try is So the, in the TNBC, normally cancer stem cells exist in two separate populations. Uh, one is mesenchymal-like and the other one is epithelial-like. Uh, they are very interconvertible, so, and they are uh, kind of depend on uh, wind and app pathways. So the one important thing is you need to target both pathways at the same time so that they don't interconvert and we can kill the both uh, stem cell populations at the same time. So, so that, so, so, the next question is for us is to can we inhibit the cancer stem cells and also the other question we want we want to answer is can we also inhibit the tumorogenesis after the treatment so we developed the nanoparticle system containing wind inhibitors and app inhibitor and we also we also went a little bit more into the study because we also want to see if nanoparticle flood form are having any effect on this these treatments and also we use like a two different uh, uh, the pdx um, PDX tumors. One is plaquenil resistant, and also other one is plaquenil sensitive. Um, so the the one important point here is so whatever the our nanoparticle system is, and also whether it's resistant or uh, resistant or sensitive. So your nanoparticle uh, with the combination with the plaquenil able to control the tumor growth. Uh, much better than other treatments, either plaquenil treatment or other treatments. For me, this is a, um, um, this is a very good data. But what what is important question for us is so the working working theory or concept here is if you eradicate cancer stem cells, you are, you are kind of your tumors should not regrow again. So that's that is what we really want to see. So for that, what we did is we basically. Uh, after the treatment, we took whatever the remaining tumors, uh, we did a serial dilution and we re-injected them in a nude mice. These are totally different mice that don't have uh, uh, any tumors or anything. And we did not do any treatment for these mice. And then we just observed if tumors are going to regrow or not. So again, the working theory here is, um, if you eradicate completely the cancer stem cells, your tumors should not grow. But if there are any cancer stem cells, stem cells are there in this, uh, in this uh, cell populations, your tumors are going to reform. So in, in the plaquenil treatment, four out of five mice develop the tumors, but in case of our nanoparticles treatment, zero out of five or one out of the five uh, mice develop the, uh, develop the tumors. So from this, like we do know that uh, we are able to eradicate most of the cancer stem cell populations uh, from our our treatments. So and I'm sorry, how much time? Okay, <laughs> okay. So and I'm going to skip. I think yesterday also I skipped this part. Okay, I'm going to skip that part again. Um. Anyway, so. So in all those all those studies, what we are showing is we can basically control the bulk tumor mass, uh, cancer stem cells, and also we can control the angiogenesis of the tumors. But all those studies we are doing in a nude mice, so mice don't have any immunity. So then the question now is, so if mice has immunity, our nanoparticle therapy is going to behave same way or not? So that's the important question for us now. So now what we are doing is instead of doing a uh, in the patient derived models, we are also simultaneously doing the similar therapies in the syngenic models to see. So if you are seeing like a similar therapeutic effects between the patient derived models and syngenic models. So that is the one important thing we are working on right now on this particular uh, set of uh, in this particular project. And then the other thing, other thing we want to know is since like a lot of nanomedicines that went into the clinic, but they, they also failed in the clinical trials, it's also very important uh, to know how our nanoparticles are really behaving inside the tumors or inside the disease conditions or is inside the body. So then like, you know, the, then the other question is, or the fundamental question is like, how do nanoparticles enter into tumor microenvironments? So again, uh, so this is the, we are kind of collaborated with uh, Warren John. Warren John is very big on the nanobio interactions. 
So, uh, so they showed in the study, they used like a multiple models and also multiple nanoparticle systems. And then from there, we noticed that particles, um, the major, in, the, in this particular study, people noticed that a majority of particles can transcytosis through the endothelial cell lines and reach into the tumors. So this is also kind of uh, new for us. So now, um, like I said before, uh, we want to see what is causing nanoparticles to transcytosis. And also, the, uh, since we have a multiple PDX tumor models with us, is, this, is it going to hold through, true for all these models? So that is the, uh, that is the uh, question we want to answer in, the, in this case. So, so as the research is uh, developing and identifying like a lot of, lot of different uh, therapeutic targets for the cancer or like you know, any other disease conditions. So, so in those cases, um, the, the single target therapies uh, might not have a lot of effect in like a lot of disease conditions. So that means the multi-targeted therapeutic approaches is the way to go. But to do this multi-targeted therapeutic approaches, uh, you need to have a vehicles or you need to have a platforms that can hold on to uh, multiple drugs or whatever their uh, physical chemical properties and then release them in an exact site inside the body that can be sequential release, uh, like a co-release or like a different part of, parts of the body, raising at the different parts of the body. So this is where uh, the nanomedicine has, uh, or nanoparticles or nanotechnology has a, uh, has a lot of potential. So, but to do this uh, multi-targeted uh, drug delivery or multi-targeted nanotherapeutic approaches, you really need to see how we were single targeted nanotherapies are going to work. You need to know in and outs of the single targeted nanotherapies. So with that aim, we are basically collaborating with the multiple people in the, in the cancer or any other disease conditions to see how our single, uh, single targeted nanoparticle systems are going to work. And then like we are going to combine this, uh, this, uh, uh, these systems and then we are planning on developing multi-targeted therapies. So with that, today, most of, most of the cancer work I showed on the cancer stem cells. We are also collaborating with uh, multiple people to uh, work on the cancer metabolism and also anti-tumor immunity. And then we recently got a grant to do a uh, M1 to, M2 to M1 uh, macrophage polarization in the, in the tumors to see if we can turn the uh, cold tumors to heart. <clears throat> and at the same time, again, like we, we also want to see how our nanoparticles are behaving inside the tumors or inside the disease condition. So again, for each studies, we are also focusing on the nanobio interactions to see how our particles are behaving. So, so any clinical translational, sorry, any translational research, uh, so it's always like a, a two sides of the coin. So a lot of people that are focusing on the fundamental research, they want to focus more on the fundamental research. And a lot of people, they want to focus more on the clinical translation or the robust uh, in vivo models. So, but no matter which side of the coin you are in, um, the ultimate goal is to cure the disease and improve the quality of the patients. Uh, and the, the, so that is the ultimate goal for us. So in our labs, what we want to do is we want to have a integrated approaches specific to therapy and also specific to patient. So we want to answer some questions on the clinical uh, clinical side or this side of the coin. And also we want to answer some questions on that side of the coin. So with that, we what we are doing is we are basically collaborating with uh, multiple people to acquire knowledge on like a wide variety of things. We are developing, we are having like more and more uh, the animal models in our arsenal. We are also developing different, different bio, bio materials so that we can have a quick clinical translation, uh, sorry, biodegradable materials. At the same time, we also want to, we are also developing advanced nanotherapeutic platform. And then for the nanobio interactions, we are like a, so we cannot, uh, we don't have a capacity to do intravital imaging at the, at the University of Ottawa, uh, but we do have a capacity to do some imaging and uh, trying to answer those questions. So with that, like uh, our program has a, um, uh, the four uh, main themes currently, and then we are interested in expanding more. And I will skip that one. And to kind of like a conclude, so, 
to win a war or to win uh, to to conquest you need like a, or i believe the, you need three system three things basically you need to have a good spies you need to have a very good military system and also you need to have a administration system so so our proof of concept studies are like a spy so so we do a lot of proof of concept studies to see uh, even if this is going to work or not so once we know that the, our concept is working then we are going to do like a, we are going to invest a lot in the animal models and do advanced uh, uh, advanced studies so if to see if this proof of concept is going to holding or not so after this most of the time lot of people ignore this part but like what we want to do is we kind of go back and see like why our nanotherapeutics have a uh, very good effect in those systems and also after the treatment what is happening to those mice and what is happening with the uh, in the, at the disease area and also other organs we want we also wants to see Uh, when compared to uh, the like a, let's say we are treating the tumors when compared to the tumors are uh, how other organs are behaving after the treatment what kind of the effects they have so the, these are uh, all the things we want to understand so that we can improve our nanoparticle systems to much better way so so with that i am going to conclude so so saying like a, so nanomedicine is basically like a endless opportunity so at this point any type of new new therapeutic target that is coming it need to be delivered that can be micro rna mrna or messenger rna uh, srna or like a ink rna any any kind of new thing so they all need to be delivered somewhere in the body so that's where nanomedicine has really nanomedicine has a lot of potential and uh, this covid vaccines really prove that the prove the potential of the nanomedicines so with that i will acknowledge all my collaborators uh, and uh, these are my current lab members and the funding and i will take any questions you guys might have okay so i don't know how to see Yes, closing. Yes, I don't know why, but okay. So uh, here can ask questions. If they send me, they will send me. Okay. 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 ಡಿಸೀಸ್ಕ್ಸ್ then you need to think about it. and then like a, um and then also you need to think about like a, how you want to do your drug 
we want them to release very quickly or over like a month or over. So all those things we need to consider before we see what nanoparticles. I don't know if I answered it. So in this case, we use the Pegasus and Nano. Pegasus and Nano, but I'm not going to use them. <laughs> okay, so no, oh, so at that time, though, so at that time, I don't have a lot. So I'm like really working on almost like the end of the So we need something that can basically kind of find with the. Uh, Fasted groups on the on the so Kaiser and had like a lot of funding groups that we can see. So, but like it also has a different other proper. So that's why we choose Kaiser okay. You can go inside this and that's some groups. No, no, no. They will go through the endocyte say, and then like a, it's a, in the endosomes, it, they typically escape from the endosome. And when they go into the cytosol, so they will really do it. So uh, actually, there is a question from Webex. Uh, so Professor Pramit uh, has a question. So Janaki, if you can unmute Professor Pramit. Yeah. Uh, show me. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Yes. You're audible. Yeah. Oh, great. So, uh, Professor Kare, thanks for the talk. It was very nice. I, uh, I have a um, very fundamental question, which always seems to bother me. Okay. So, when you, uh, when you uh, apply these nanoparticle-based therapeutics, how do you make them target-specific? That is my first question. You cannot. Right. And the second part is, uh, so you can detail uh, on it a bit more. And the second part of the question is that when the particle enters the system and it goes to the bloodstream or whatever, right, it it might start accumulating that what we call the corona formation or, you know, uh, what happens typically. Right, How right. is that taken care of? So the corona formation will, will happen. That's true. Okay. But like a... Uh, so most of the studies, if you look at it for the corona formation, they show them on the metal particles. So how that is going to be, is it going to be the similar for the um, for the polymeric particles? Might be, might not be. Okay, But it, it does have like a, some protein accumulation on the surface of the nanoparticles. But it doesn't mean that we cannot take them to the tumors. So maybe that's a part of the a part of the solution too. Maybe maybe that's why they are getting out of the blood circulation at the tumors. So in those things, you always need to compare with a free drug. So so what are the advantages when compared to the free drug administration? So then, like you know, then you you kind of have a base standards, and then from there you can start building up. So what would be your typical tolerance level? That means when you take a free drug and you take your nanoparticle based formulation, what, uh, you know, in what the, in margin the, would you say that it gives you good, very good results? So in mice, I can inject almost 10 milligrams of polymeric nanoparticles and they will still survive. But I don't think, uh, so then like you need to think about the drug too. But like you no, know, actually, when compared to when compared to drug with the nanoparticles, you can inject them at least five to ten times higher, and then mice still survive. Okay. So, in in other words, I, if I if I am injecting like a ten mix of plaquetaxel and mice dying, you can inject ten mix of plaquetaxel in the nanoparticles and mice will survive. Okay, but with, with regards to the specificity in terms of uh, targeting, you know, can we put in like, uh, 
you know, tumor cell receptors or anything on the nanoparticle to make them more target specific? So, so yes and no. Okay, so no matter what you put on the targeting ligand for the for the nanoparticles, right? So, like you said, like so, proteins are going to coat on them. So, and also that targeting ligand is not going to be effective until it reaches to the uh, it reaches into the tumors. Unless you are targeting something in the blood circulation, particular protein you want to be coated on the nanoparticles. So that kind of targeting will work. But if you are putting like a some targeting ligand that will go and bind to the tumors or tumor cells, I highly doubt that that targeting is going to work. So that's why like a, this lot of lot of this targeted nanomedicines failed in the clinical trials. Um, you. Typically, you don't need targeting ligand for nanoparticles to drive them to the tumors. But after they reached into the tumors, if you have a targeting ligand that might help your nanoparticles to bind to that particular tumor cell. But remember, even the, once they get out of the blood circulation, they really need to go or they really need to penetrate a long way before they even reach to the tumors. Okay, so there's like a lot of things that we we don't know or people don't know. So if we can understand that and then we have a better targeting system in the future, it's possible. But like right now, um, right now in my opinion, you are targeting ligand, having it going to the tumors is very unlikely with a targeting ligand. Uh, get it. And the last uh, point from my end is, or the last query is, that uh, when you have these uh, therapeutics built into your polymer, uh, you know, nanocomposite or nanomaterial, and what is the trigger for the delivery of the therapeutics at the site of interest? I mean, can it just uh, deliver the therapeutic or the medicine somewhere else, not necessarily the tumor? Somewhere else in the sense like, so the nanoparticles are not going to go typically tumors. You need to guide them to go into the tumors. But you know, you just like any other drug. So it will, when it circulate in the, into the blood, in the blood circulation, there's a good possibility that they will be filtered in the liver, kidneys. And if there is any other problems in the liver endothelial layers, okay, there's a, there's a good chance that your particles will get out. So one thing you can do is you can develop a um, stimulant responsive type nanoparticle system so that like, you know, if it's in the tumors, if it's in the particular stimuli, then only it will release the drug. If not, if a drug is going to be still in the nanoparticle. So th that thing is possible, but, but human tumors are so heterogeneous, I highly, I should not say highly doubt. You need to have a better nanoparticle system to have to see any advantages in the clinic for in those for those things. So we are developing for like a, for the for the neurodegenerative diseases because we believe that it's much easier to handle it. Um, but yeah, so there is a good possibility that nanoparticles are going to go everywhere. So I'm not going to rely on that. Okay. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Shomik. So, so the it has a, it. So the we are targeting neuroinflammation basically. So we have a inflammatory um, response to nanoparticles. So that's that is what we are thinking of. I don't have a complete story. That's why I'm not. So right now I'm modeling on the polymeric weight and polymer composition, but we can that again we can always modify. So in some cases we can do like a redox responsive, we can do pH responsive. But again, those things yes we can do. Uh, we might be able to have a good good data in the mice. 
But if you are looking, your aim is to do a clinical translation. Do you want to have that much complex system into the humans where you we really don't understand a lot of things? You would, I feel like a clinicians would like a simple system to work with than the complex system. So that's a, that's a trade off. So do we want to do a clinical translation or do you want to do public or do you want to do a very good study and publish paper? So I want to go on both sides. So, and so I will do some work on that side, some work on that. Batch variations, that's true. So, so the, I'm not showing that one, but like a, we basically did a multiple, uh, uh, multiple formulation and a freeze. So now then uh, once we have like we know the, uh, the formulation that we like, then we have a microfluidic system that we basically do automated things. So you, what you need is the, you need a ratio. You need to have a particular ratio, synergistic ratio between. Yeah, so that's why, like, so that's why we are using a microfluidic system, so it's automated system. So what we are thinking is, uh, so when we when we do for mice, we can use we are using it, so we can do like a similar condition, but uh, we can use a bigger channel and bigger thing. So for the company people, when we are when, when they are producing this so bigger batch of nanoparticle system, that is what they want. So if we can provide this this schematics. Of how we are developing, so then they they are going to be scale up. Right. Uh, what is this spine jump that you know? Oh, so good question. Because it looks like very small. Yeah. So the Phoenix tumors, uh, they grow very. First of all, they grow fast, and also they grow uncontrolled. We don't have any control over the Phoenix tumor. So. No, but still. Yeah, even we use Sorry, even... That's not what we observe. That, that's what I'm trying to say. So we don't have a good control over. And also the other thing, um, other thing I want to explain is, so when we put like a tumor, so we have a tumor chunk, right? So you really need to cut them into like a pieces. So you you cannot like a you cannot cut them exactly the equal shape or equal size of the thing. No, yeah, it will be obvious there will be a, like, uh, but my question is, when you have started the injection? Two, two weeks after the... What one? What the tumor volume, tumor volume, where you are implanting this. Point. I don't remember the tumor. Because if you think about the image, the point is very small. At that time, you cannot detect the tumor. It's very positive, yes. So but I need to. I need to look at the logistics too, right? And when you have checked the stem cells, okay. at the same time or after some? No, at the end. Yeah, at the end of the tumor. Stem cells started the drug injection. At that time, there will be no stem cells because that is very small tumor. So the, the I'm sorry. So but when, when, why when why I want to change something? No, because your idea is your goal is to inhibit the stem cell proliferation. Right. Unless there is stem cell, then how we can sure that your drug is what so the, the stem cells? In the, in the in those stem cells, the way those stem cells develop are like a differentiated. So once you have your plaque acid synthesis, so once you are once stem cells. So those those are like stem cell like Calidicin cells, right? Hmm? Stem cell. So calidexin is not a stem cell. No, no, plaquenexin treatment will enhance your stem cell. Yeah, so, but so what you have which is the yeah, yeah. There so is no so basically what porphyrin and all those things are uh, stem cell inhibitors. Okay. So the what I'm trying to say is 
So if you if you take like a small tumors or any tumors, right? so unless you treat them with a the plaquetide cell, there is not going to be our working theory is your plaquetide cell will enhance the cancer cell cell population. So so that's why all our treatments have a plaquetide. So so initially, so the you are right. Why we are using like a um, why we are doing like a with a very small because in clinical trials most of the time we don't. But they they are growing so uncontrollably. You are not going to have that much time to do the treatment for us. So that's why we want to start injections very early. How many times? So every two days. Um, in one study, 20 days, other study, 27 yeah, days. Give the data to 22 days. So, so, depend on the studies, right? Like, be anywhere between 20 no, but I'm just saying this one because once, because if they are still in the response phase, once you stop the index on the right, then it will relapse. Because you have not given enough time to get it relapsed. So that's the one way to look at the study. Other way to look at the study is look for the cancer cells, right? But like when you are so the main problem in the cancer is the relapse. Yes. Okay. So again, so what I'm trying to say is there are several ways to answer the study. So in that particular study, we choose to check for the cancer cells. Maybe in other study, we will let go after the treatment to see the relapse. But all these things. Are logistics first, so you need to look at the what what tumor values you have for the control mice. If your control mice is already growing on like a very very high, we need to stack those mice, right? So then like a so do we stack the mice and we let go new mice for a while, or you want to stop it? And also, what kind of resources we have? But you can stop. This mice just start with the tumor. Sacrifice when the tumor is. Can continue the treatment. We can continue, but we choose to basically look for the cancer. Yeah, there is no data on survival. We are we are not looking at the survival. We don't we don't look for the survival. Or maybe in the next in the future, we will also look for the survival. Again, like you know, these are all like a. Okay, I agree with all the points. But uh, when we do the experiments, we need to look at the logistics and we need to look at what we are offering and uh, is this experiment is going to answer our question. That's our focus. So let's say if I'm focusing on the survival rate, then you know, then maybe I will design my experiment this way. And then like a continue. But I'm not saying like we should not look for the survival rate. Or we should. Um it's 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 at that stage where we are at and what we want. I have a uh, like question related to this actually. Sure. So, uh, for example, if you have some nanoparticles uh, which is interacting with tumor, so uh, is there any cooperative effect? Like, for example, if some of the cells, I mean, some of the initial nanoparticles kill some of the cells in the tumor, is it becomes uh, easier for the subsequent nanoparticles to go through easily or is there any effect like that no I, I honestly i don't know that's one thing i want to i want to check to be honest i don't know um it's also very good possibility that your tumor cells can recognize your nanoparticles and kick them out okay because they're already used to yeah so, so opposite... we, we, we don't know for sure that uh, and also that's the other thing right like you know so we know we know that nanoparticles reach to tumor micro environment um, or at least in 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 my case, maybe other people have a better idea. I have no idea, but I I don't know how long they are really penetrating and they are reaching to the tumors or not. We don't know that part. But like you know, as long as your particles are there and releasing the drugs, you you do see some effect. So is it killing only like a pericytes on the surface and not the tumor cells? It's very possible too. We don't know. So if the so, cooperativity uh, you know exists, then it will be. Uh, better to you know release drugs gradually than a single shot, right? Yeah, so th that's what I'm trying to say. Like, so the cancer stem, cancer cells are 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 like you know they will develop resistance very quickly. They have like a several mechanisms to develop resistance. So 
if you are i don't know if you if you kill like a bunch of cells and the remaining cells will automatically uptake the cancer uh, like a nanoparticles i don't know they might like a become resistant already or mm -hmm. they might have mechanisms to kick we already think that a lot of these particles when they uptake most of the time cells will kick them out okay so it's a continuous continuous process so we don't know that well so we have a, I mean, uh, we have a question from uh, from the audience on WebEx, so from the chat. So Shiv uh, asks, like, how binding of miRNA active uh, or uh, activate or repress the system? How binding of miRNA activate or repress the system? Please focus light on modulation of gene expression in nanomedicine condition. So sure what they're asking. No binding of repress the system. I think this is so it's like in the in the sorry, uh, you are talking about other part of the body or is it in the in the in the macrophages? In mac in macrophages. Okay, can you can you can you elaborate your question again, please? Sorry, sir, you have transported the miRNA into the macrophages to stop the system. Same, uh, you have to use two miRNA. How one right. mRNA activate the system and other is repressing the system. Right. So how? So we basically, so we don't treat both nanoparticles at the same time. So we those particles either going to have a mir two to three or MIR 33. Does, does that answer your question? Sir, how they are working actually? I want to know that. Two what do you mean by how they are working? Meaning BANA and MIRNA bind on a certain system, how it works, how it repress the oh, system. So, so basically, the once they release in the, in the complex, okay, they are going to bind to, um, I think it's, they are binding to the risk complex. Are like a so they will basically bind to ABCA one related So it is holding, then like a mess up would be like a serving book. Questions? Okay, so I think, uh, so you'll be available for some time probably, Easy. so you can interact. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then uh, let's thank Professor Suresh. So it seems like this nanoparticle thing is, uh, it's kind of a David, David Goliath battle, but I think it's uh, surely coming up and uh, to solve a lot of problems in the future. So thank you very much for you know taking some time out and uh, coming and giving this lecture. So I'm sure uh, people here and online both enjoyed your talk very much. And I would like to thank Professor Shivaji, who, uh, who is the host.
for today's talk and also our HOD and other organizers of Pratidwani for arranging this, uh, particularly Professor Janaki Ram, who is uh, taking care of the streaming services today. So thank you everyone. And uh, we'll have our next talk on uh, July 19th. So uh, stay tuned and uh, we'll, we'll circulate an email soon. So that we'll, we expect to see you there. There. Okay, so thank you everyone and have a nice day.